just get started. Um, thank you um, for everyone who came out to join us today. I'm thrilled to have you all in this space um, as we engage in this important dialogue about public education, education reform, corporate greed, racism, and the impact on us, particularly our democracy. I want to take a moment to thank all the organizers and co sponsors who helped make this event happen. Thank you to Maps of Freedom School. Um, hey, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Montclair Cares About Schools, South Orange Maplewood Education Association, SOMEA, um, and South Orange Maplewood Cares About Schools, and NJEA. You all made this possible. Um, reading Shawnee's story brought me to literal tears. Um, and I mean that deep in the depths of my soul. I know Shawnee could be any one of us at any given time. My awakening happened in 2010 and 2011 when I was a classroom teacher. Um, I came into a profession at the start of No Child Left Behind, a law that was based off of the myth of the Texas miracle. Let me say that again, a myth. A myth that a school district in Texas made 100% attendance, 100% graduation, 100% proficiency on standardized tests, and drastic decrease in dropout rates, which we know is impossible. As researchers, um, as the researcher Walt Henny, Hanley, Hanny described them, these results were nothing more than a mess, an illusion. Unfortunately, the myth brought about real policy changes, pedagogical changes and practices that have brought us here tonight. These policy changes are what brought us adequately to progress, a hyper increase in standardized tests, pedagogical practices that place and heighten in influence on teaching to the test, the no excuses lexicon and practices, and ultimately the Obama administration's race to the top policies and grants that advocate for school closures, charter schools, turnaround schools, and transformation schools. Since the inception of this nation, black and brown and indigenous bodies Black and brown um, indigenous existence have been under attack and threat, dispossessed from their lands through land theft, land seizures, forced relocation, redlining, gentrification, you name it. This story is a much greater story than Shawnee Robinson and the individual educators charged with RICO and the other charges. This story is a story of a white supremacist capitalist patriarchy America that I have known. It is a story of the ways in which we all are impacted by. With that said, I would like to introduce you to Shani Robinson and Anna Simonton. So thank you. Okay. Thank you everyone. I really appreciate um, everyone coming. This means a lot to me. Um, yeah, so we just want to start with, you can kind of give us a little bit more background around um, this, the context, build some context for why we're here and the story. So I was one of the teachers convicted in the Atlanta Public Schools cheating trial. And I wrote this book for my son. I was pregnant with him during the entire eight month trial. And afterwards, I was just thinking like, how in the world am I going to explain this to my son when he grows up? And so this book actually started off as a journal. Um, and then as I started to just connect the dots and put the pieces together, I realized that my story was a part of an even larger story about the intentional dismantling of public education in this country. And so our book asks the question, you know, who has really been cheating these children? It's not their educators. But who has really been cheating these children? They, they've been cheated through the willful destruction of their communities and through underfunding and privatizing their schools. And so I later met Anna. She has been awesome. She actually matriculated through Atlanta Public Schools. Um, and she was just such a blessing to co-author um, this book. Um, would you like to? Thank you. Thank you all so much for having us. Um, it's been an honor to work with Shani on this. Um, as someone who came up through Atlanta Public Schools and my middle school counselor was actually convicted in this case as well. Um, and I watched the convictions handed down, like many folks, um, in 2015 um, on the news, sort of having known that the trial was 
happening but not really following it because it just didn't register for many people until we actually saw the handcuffs go on. And that sparked outrage, but it was too late. Um, so I think one of the most important opportunities we have with this book right now and um, with these amazing opportunities to meet folks like you is that the appeals in this case are actually just getting started. And so we have another chance to get this right and to tell the story, the real story of what happened with the Atlanta Public Schools cheating scandal um, and to push for a different outcome. So I'm just going to really quick recap um, sort of the time frame, what the, what the, where the scandal came from, so that we kind of are all on the same page, um, and then turn it over to Shani to, to get into her story. So the Atlanta Public Schools cheating scandal came out of some reporting by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, our local newspaper, um, beginning with some articles in 2008 that spanned over into 2009, looking at first retest scores, so students who had taken our uh, state standardized test, Criterion Referencing Competency, Competency Test, CRCT, took it in the spring, failed it, retook it in the summer, passed with flying colors, and these reporters were saying, you know, how is that possible? The state did an audit that confirmed those findings, um, and then the newspaper looked at the 2009 CRC test scores, and those become the scores that are uh, at issue in this trial. Um, and that prompted the state to do an even uh, more widespread investigation. So they did a wrong-to-right erasure analysis across the state, looking at the instances of where students had erased their answer on these scantrons, bubbled in the correct answer, and found, uh, you know, at a certain point, if there's a high prevalence of that, it becomes statistically improbable that it's the student actually making those changes. They found um, an improbably high number of those wrong to right erasures in 20% of Georgia schools, required those school districts to do internal investigations, and the governor at the time, Sonny Perdue, he's now our uh, agriculture secretary for the federal government, um, <laughs> decided that Atlanta Public Schools and one other County, we will go into this more, we don't really hear about them, Doherty County did not do sufficient internal investigations and so he took this really um, surprising move of saying we're going to have a state investigation into these two school districts, appointed um, three lead investigators who were his buddies, their private attorneys, former attorney general, folks like that, uh, gave them full reign of the Georgia Bureau of Investigations, GBI agents, and threw about $2 million, $2 million into the APS investigation alone. That led to the um, implication, to a report that implicated 44 schools in Atlanta Public Schools, 178 ed educators. That prompted the local district attorney to do an investigation and ultimately indict 35 educators. Many folks took plea deals, uh, 11 people went to trial, and in April of 2015, um, I'm sorry, 12 people went to trial, 11 people were convicted, seven are still appealing. So that's the kind of bird's eye view of what we're talking about tonight. And just to go into my story and how I was dragged into this entire thing, I taught first grade. And so I taught six-year-olds, which I think it was ridiculous that six-year-olds have to sit for hours at a time and take a standardized test yeah. in the first yeah. place. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like one, one little boy was like falling out of his chair and, you know, they were doodling all on their booklets. You know, they were bored. Um, and so each year, Teachers were called into, that particular year, we were called into a computer lab. I think the year before, it was like a library where we were supposed to erase the stray marks off of our students' test booklets. So the year in question is the 2009 CRCT um, scores. And so I was called into a computer lab with first and second grade teachers, and I was told to erase the stray marks and to fix some illegible handwriting off of my students' test booklets that was in the demographic section because some of their handwriting was a little sloppy. And so I did what I was told. I erased the stray marks and I handed my test booklets back to the testing coordinator. And that, I was in there for about 20 minutes. And that was the end of the story, or so I thought. Mm -hmm. um, in October 2010, I got a phone call from a GBI agent, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. And I wasn't even working for the school system anymore. I was actually working at a counseling agency because I majored in psychology. And as a Teach for America recruit, we only, um, mm -hmm. we only commit to teaching for two years. And so the fact that I stayed three years, you know, I was thinking I stayed an extra year, you know. <laughs> um, 
But, so strangely, I meet this DBI agent in a mall parking lot. And so he tells me that there's been an erasure analysis done and that in my class specifically, there were high levels of wrong to right erasures. And that's what they were looking at. How many times did um, an answer go from wrong to right? Because after a certain amount of times, it's like statistically improbable that that would actually happen. And so he asked me, um, did anyone ever place any pressure on me to change my students' answers? And I told him, no. Um, and he asked me, you know, did you change any answers? And I said, no. And then he pulls out this pre-written voluntary statement form for me to sign. And it did say voluntary on it, so technically I didn't have to sign, but I didn't mind signing. Um, what did it say? Oh, so the, it was basically saying that I didn't have any knowledge about cheating and I didn't cheat. And at the time, I didn't know that the GBI agents had actually gone into the schools that day and teachers were pulled from their classrooms. It was spur of the moment. There were no attorneys present in these initial stages. And they were asked to sign this form. And so you have a GBI agent. You know, this is law enforcement. Yeah. <laughs> telling you to sign a pre-written form that they've already mapped out for you. Um, and so we later learned that some educators were actually charged with false statements and writings, which is a felony for signing a form. And so it's almost in a sense of, you know, if, if these agents were telling teachers the truth, like, hey, sign this, you could be charged with a felony later on, but go ahead and sign. Maybe some educators <laughs> might not have signed the form. Um, and so, let's see, where are we now? So that led to the RICO, the mm -hmm. RICO charges were on top of that. So maybe we'll talk about so, what the RICO charges were about. So Good Friday mm -hmm. of 2013, I was carpooling with a coworker, and she was actually driving, thank goodness, um, because my husband called me and told me that I was indicted in the cheating scandal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was thinking, what, you know? Um, he said that I saw your name scrolling across the bottom of the screen on the news. This is how I learned that I was indicted. And he said they charged you with racketeering. And I was like, what is, what is RICO? What is racketeering? Um, I'm in shock that first I've actually been indicted for a crime that I did not commit. And then they charged me with racketeering. The only thing that I knew about racketeering was that it dealt with money. I knew it was a yeah. serious crime, you know, from watching the Sons of Anarchy. <laughs> and I knew it was a serious crime. Um, and so I was thinking, the way it was portrayed in the media was that teachers had cheated on their students' tests mm -hmm. to get money, to get a payout. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is that in my school, we did not meet our district targets, which is how you would have received bonus money. The district targets were benchmarks imposed by the APS school board and administration. So I never received any money, but my bond was $200,000. And it was one of the lowest. There were other bonds that were in the millions. And they were eventually lowered, but this is what they did. So in order to lower our bonds, they we had to agree to be placed under a gag order so that we couldn't talk to the media and tell our side of the story. That was because no one had that kind of money. Yeah. Um, and so, and I'm sorry, I get um, sidetracked. I, mm -hmm. I have little blackout moments <laughs> when, I, when I tell the story. Yeah. Um, right, so later, I guess we can get into maybe some of these. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah, so if you're wondering how does a you know, a regular day of testing, erasing stray marks, turn into these charges. Yes, there was the wrong to right erasure analysis, but also um, someone else who was in that computer lab, a fellow teacher, accused Shawnee after being interrogated multiple times by the GBI, first telling them, no, I didn't cheat, no, nobody was cheating, I don't know what you're talking about, and after rounds of interrogation um, and an offer of immunity, um, started naming names, and that's what we saw, that's how we saw people get dragged into this, um, and similarly, once those 30, 35 people were indicted, um, the same pressure was applied to take plea deals and agree to testify in this case. 
Um, so that could get us toward talking about the trial. I don't know if you want to go that direction. Or yeah, that would be great if you would go in a little bit about the trial and look back what happened during that time. Mm -hmm. um, the experiences and, you know, even in particular with the one with the, the form that people had, the involuntary form, like we see that people came back and recanted too mm -hmm. and said, oh, you know, maybe what I did was wrong because they were taking plea deals after that um, for fear of right. losing so much. So can you talk a little bit about that? So I was facing 25 years in prison and other people were facing up to 40 years in prison. And one of my co-defendants, and she actually later took a plea deal. Um, she was a veteran teacher. She worked at my school. <clears throat> but she was trying to explain to the judge how she had been coerced into signing the form. And they really pulled an underhanded move. Because here you have a form that says voluntary. <laughs> and so what they did was they basically said, well, was it true? Why would you, why would you feel compelled to sign a form you know, if it wasn't true. And so teachers were put between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. What do you even say to that, you know? Um, and so just some of the hypocrisy, just some of the things that were just so hypocritical, the district attorney who actually prosecuted the case, his wife worked at a school where cheating occurred. No one from her school was ever indicted. She wasn't indicted. And so this was really a conflict of interest for him to even prosecute this case from the very beginning. Um, I think that's a good time to talk about Sunny Liberty, too, mm -hmm. the 2009 So the same time that the GBI agents came into the schools, the governor, Sonny Perdue at the time, used the same questionable test scores in an application to get a $400 million federal race at the top grant. So, I never received any bonus money. Many of my co-defendants never received any bonus money. And if they did, it might have been $500 or $1,000, which we know as educators, we put that right back into our classrooms anyway. Um, and so 20% of the scores in Georgia were inflated, but they still use those scores in the application. And something similar actually happened in Washington, D.C. There was a woman named Adele, I believe her last name is Cawthorn or Cawthorn, but she actually filed a lawsuit with the district saying the same thing, that you all use inflated test scores in the race of the top application. So you have these educators who barely got any money, and the state who received $400 million, but they charged us with racketeering. Yeah. You know, so that just shows the injustice. Um, and what I've also noticed too, like with the race at the top, because this actually came up um, when we got the grant back in um, 2011, I want to say, um, and it was $6 million from one of the schools that we received. And I say to this day, can you show any evidence that this was, that, that money was even used effectively, right? And no one can even, so this $400 million, can you show us that this the money was even used effectively? Because what you're talking about is blaming individual teachers for maybe getting $500, which many didn't even get anything, but this $400 million, how did it impact, and how, how did it get to the students? And did it ever get to the students, right? And what did you use it for? And no one ever is being held accountable, and that's it, right? We don't know how that $400 million was yeah. siphoned, whose hands were, yeah. you know, that the uh, money was ever placed in. Um, so, and just moving toward the trial, the trial was actually like a circus. There were people that recanted their stories, not surprisingly, if you were facing 40 years in prison, yeah. and basically said, you know, I was just stressed out from the entire ordeal, mm -hmm. um, but this didn't actually happen in the way that I said that it happened. Um, there were witnesses who perjured themselves, and even the judge, who we felt like was clearly slanted toward the prosecutor. So for him to make this comment, it spoke volumes, but he said, Perjury is being committed daily here. Mm -hmm. But he didn't strike anyone's testimony. He didn't declare a mistrial. Mm -hmm. um, there was a situation where he, um, he had a private conversation with the district attorney. And when it came to light, our, our defense attorneys, they were, they were really upset about it. And instead of him really addressing the issue, he turns to a, one of the district attorneys and he said, I'm sorry, he, he turns to one of the defense attorneys and says, I saw you jaywalking 
If you do it again, I'm gonna have you cite it. You know, it was like, what does this have to do with anything? I mean, this is just some of the foolishness that happened during the trial. Yeah, just to this judge began the trial by holding up a t-shirt. He said, I bought this t-shirt at Walmart. I bought these iron-on letters, and I made a t-shirt that says, I'm talking and I can't shut up. And this is called the Dubious Achievement Award to any attorney who talks for too long. Okay, so that set the tone for the theatrics that he would continue throughout this trial. Yes. So that's where these comments like, um, I'm going to cite you for jaywalking, mm -hmm. um, what happened with the witness that was trying to uh, identify Tamara Cotman. So there was a witness that was asked to identify one of my co-defendants, and so she mm -hmm. steps down from the witness stand and starts walking around the room, and the judge calls out to her and says, you're getting cold. So the lady turns around and starts walking in the opposite direction. She never recognized my co-defendant and eventually returned back to the witness stand. And my co-defendant is Tamara Cotman, who is currently in prison right now. Mm -hmm. She's been in prison since October of 2000, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this past October. Um, but look how her case was handled. Mm -hmm. And there was another situation, because I have two co-defendants who are in prison. Um, there was another situation where the lead prosecutor, Bonnie Willis, was caught making facial expressions toward the jury, and the judge did tell her to stop. Um, but this is a, another co-defendant who's in prison right now. And it was it, it was her third time this prosecutor being called out in open court, either to either for making facial expressions at the jury or during the middle of someone's testimony. Mm. So these are the things that we had to deal with. Um, The one final anecdote about this judge that always gets me is how when the prosecution rested, it was the, after six months, so this is the longest criminal trial in Georgia history. This is what they decided to put these resources behind. Um, six months of, of state witnesses, and so defense testimony starts. After nine witnesses, there have been 133 called by the prosecution. After nine defense witnesses, this judge says, are you done yet? How many more of these witnesses do you plan to call? So he is diminishing the defense in the eyes of the jury. Um, and I think that that's, you know, people just wonder, like, how did this verdict get handed down if, if you know, if these teachers didn't do this? Mm -hmm. that's, that's how it happened, because of the way that it was so slanted toward the prosecution, in part by the judge. Um, and things were swept over, like the, one of the lead investigators on, from the state investigation testified on the witness stand that um, bonus money had nothing to do with the motivation for why cheating happened. That completely undermines the RICO charge. Mm -hmm. um, and yet that just sort of got lost in the six months of stuff. Um, and, you know, what became clear was that there were all these stories, teachers talking about cheating that happened at their school, but none that implicated the actual people on trial. So what the prosecution had were, were stories about cheating and we don't know the answers. Like we're not disputing that some cheating happened, but the people who stood trial, the evidence against them was flimsy at best. Mm -hmm. It was nothing. Mm -hmm. And even after we were all, well, there was one person who was found not guilty, but there were um, eleven of us that were found guilty. And what they wanted us to do was to give up our constitutional right to appeal. And they really tried to bully my co-defendants um, into doing it because we, the judge told our defense attorneys that he would grant first offender status and he would grant, what was the other thing? The appeal bond. The appeal bond. And so once he learned that my co-defendants were not going for it, they said, no, we're not taking that sentencing agreement because you want us to give up our constitutional right to appeal. He took it back and he said, well, I'm not granting any of that. And so our defense attorneys pushed back and they said, judge, you've already agreed to this. Mm -hmm. He said, well, I guess I'm just an Indian giver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so our attorneys had to fight. He, he later did give us the appeal con, but I mean, just to have to go through yeah. that to even yeah. keep, you know, get him to keep his work. Um, so those were the things that happened during the trial. Yeah, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about, and that's you know, um, about, I think, the Superintendent Davis, where um, we see even how 
there's a lot being, like a lot of shuffling being placed, put in, be, uh, people being put in place to either, um, I think it was the mayor, where they were just not giving the students, the, the district, the, the funds that they needed, right? They were, you know, stripping them of the resources or using the resources for other things, even though they owed Atlantic Public Schools that money, and it was money that wasn't being um, allocated to the district. So if you could speak a little bit to that, too, as well. Definitely, yeah. So one of the things that we talk about in the book is the way that um, the schools in Atlanta, and this is I'm sure true elsewhere, were being used to leverage real estate development and gentrify Atlanta, and the two are very intimately connected. One of the ways that that happens is through something called tax allocation districts. In other places, it's called tax increment financing or TIFs. We have TADs, and what it is is a geographic zone where the property tax the property taxes are frozen at a certain year, and then as property values go up, the additional revenue is put into a slush fund for developers. Mm -hmm. So it's a way of diverting public funds to private development. And those public funds, because they're property tax dollars, are supposed to go to the city, the county, and the school system. So Atlanta Public Schools has missed out on $434 million since the year 2000 to build luxury condos, um, boutique office buildings, mm -hmm. Um, the same things that are pushing out the very students that that, those, that money is intended for. It's also been um, building something called the Beltline, which is this big rails to trails project that is one of the main drivers of gentrification in the city. Uh, it just gets so hyped. It's like every new business that's marketed toward upwardly mobile white millennials like wants to be on the Beltline, and houses are getting flipped all along the Beltline mm -hmm. um, in historically black neighborhoods. So the Beltline um, deal with Atlanta Public Schools um, offered something called payment in lieu of taxes. So even though the school was giving up most of the property taxes it would be owed in order to uh, build the Beltline, they were going to get a fraction of that in these sort of fixed payments. Well, the city reneged on that and wasn't even paying those, and they were in arrears. So as, uh, I think it was during pretrial hearings, this kind of, this blew up because the school board finally was like, listen, we need this money. And Kasim Reed, our mayor at the time, um, threw a tantrum and said, uh, the Beltline, we're not paying you this money because the Beltline is more popular by far than Atlanta public schools. And of course he was referring to the sort of sullied reputation of the school system as a result of this so-called cheating scandal. So we see the way that this narrative is being constructed to um, portray the school system as so utterly corrupt and, mm -hmm. and terrible um, and justify the misuse of education dollars mm -hmm. to further gentrification um, and enrich real estate developers in the city. So that's one of the ways that private interests have uh, benefited from the cheating scandal. Mm -hmm. um, and just to go into some history and how educators have been scapegoated during the closing arguments, one of the lead prosecutors was posing these odd questions, I call them odd, to the jury. He was making statements like, why is crime so high? Why are you scared somebody going to hit you on the back of your head and take your car? Who's breaking into your house? He was saying it was our fault, the educator's fault. You're right, they're helpless, they're hopeless. They, they cheated our children. And you heard Anna just say, a APS was missing out on $434 million. Um, what educators were responsible for that? None. Mm -hmm. um, and then also, if you go back into the history of some of these communities, there were 44 schools that were implicated in the, in the investigative report. 11 of those schools are where teachers and administrators were actually pulled from to go on the RICO indictment. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the history of those communities back in the 1940s and 50s, they were actually thriving black communities. There were several black owned businesses. Mm. It was safe, people rarely locked their doors. Mm. And so, but as more white people started moving to the suburbs and more black people started moving to the city, it actually yielded greater black political power. Mm. So this was concerning to the white business elite. And so they actually created this plan called the Lochner Plan which was a plan for highway construction mm -hmm. to rip mm -hmm. right, right through, through the, the community. communities to that were thriving. <laughs> and so thousands of people were displaced, hundreds of homes taken through eminent domain. Mm -hmm. And then you know you have 
the drug wars. Um, there was a veteran teacher at my school who told me that, you know, in the 70s, before the crack epidemic, that everything was completely different. She said that there was so much parental involvement, they had to put the parents on a waiting list just because they wanted to be so involved with their um, kids' education. Um, but after the crack epidemic, everything changed. Um, and so then you have mass incarceration. You know, you have so many different factors that have led to the destruction of these neighborhoods and communities. And so to have someone say it was the educator's fault, they did it, mm -hmm. you know, without taking all of these other factors into consideration. And it wasn't just him, it was like the overall sentiment that they were trying to portray. Um, that somehow you could just hold these educators accountable, you know, for all the problems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that kind of builds on, there's been a rhetoric around, like, uh, I know where you, you hear the saying, and it's actually a distortion of the research, that the teacher is the most important factor, right, in a, child's, in a child's education or in a child's performance or how a child will do in school. Like it, they're, they're the most important factor, but that's a distortion on what the research actually says, like the teacher is the most important in school factor, right? <laughs> but then you've got these reformers who have taken that little bit of information, you've got a little piece of information, and then they blow it up and make it this big thing, and then that was the, the rhetoric that's been going around. Like we would hear like a Corey book or you would hear like all these superintendents saying like, oh, the teacher's the most important factor. So then, which leads to how they're able to blame Poverty, right? The yeah. <laughs> like the impact or the impact and the effects of poverty on teachers who actually really there's so many larger things at play here that we're not considering or we are considering what they're trying to scapegoat as you say, right. and, and we're trying to pull the wool over our eyes so that we can't really see or examine that there are deeper issues at play. Yeah. Yeah, and it's important to, to name names because a lot of times what we found is that like the same people who have been harming uh, black communities in a way that yeah. impacts students' uh, education experience and their whole lives, and education is not <laughs> divorced from our whole lives, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, that, that those were some of the people that were the biggest proponents of this narrative around the cheating scandal and constructing the scandal themselves. So one example is Mike Bowers, who was one of the lead investigators appointed by the governor to um, investigate Atlanta public schools. And he was um, the attorney general of Georgia from the mid 80s through hmm. late 90s and was responsible for pushing and implementing the sort of tough on crime, so called tough on crime mm -hmm. laws that vastly expanded uh, mass incarceration in Georgia, mm -hmm. um, affecting, of course, predominantly black and brown communities and causing the kind of generational trauma that students are then saddled with mm -hmm. and that teachers are then um, mm -hmm. you know, faced with um, on the day to day. He ran for governor in 1996 and to drum up uh, fear in his yes. white voter base said, you gotta watch out because there's a heck of a lot more five-year-olds today than there were 10 years ago. He's not talking about any five-year-olds, he's talking about black five-year-olds mm -hmm. because then he says, they're super predators. They're coming. <laughs> and he, this is the same man that is talking about the same children years later going on CNN and all, all the news circuits saying these teachers cheated the children, the poor little children. My heart weeps for these children mm -hmm. that he calls super predators. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, like the, the common narrative that we're seeing just throughout how we see black and brown folks depicted in our society and then just to justify how we can actually either take money from their communities and take resources from their communities and then push them into the prison industrial complex, which is just a furthering of that, yeah. And I think we forgot to even talk about um, Mike Bowers and even his investigation on how the teachers were treated. Uh, when I was, when I had to turn myself in, I heard all kinds of stories about how teachers were coerced and threatened. There was one GBI agent who put his gun out on the table during the middle of an interview. And there was another agent, I heard a story about how he threatened to take a teacher's own children away from her if she didn't cooperate. They were threatening um, the teacher's pensions, you know. I mean, they just to conduct an investigation like that, it's not hard to believe that there are some people who would be willing to say anything to get out of trouble. And that's the problem. Teachers, educators were pitted against each other 
Um, and it was, it was really unfortunate, it was really unfair. This didn't happen anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, and in this country, there's been over 40 states with cheating allegations. Mm -hmm. 14 of those states is, was considered to be widespread cheating. Mm -hmm. And in Washington, D.C., there were 103 schools that were flagged for suspiciously high test scores. Mm -hmm. So this was something that was happening all over the country. Mm -hmm. So why were the black educators of Atlanta mm -hmm. charged with racketeering, mm -hmm. you know, false statements and writings, false mm -hmm. swearing? Um, it was really blown out of proportion. Mm -hmm. And so I, I really hope that one day someone can do an investigation into that matter. Mm -hmm. Um, because we don't even know what that could uncover. Mm -hmm. Just what's on the surface is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just, you know, di digging a little deeper, how much could we uncover about what happened and why this happened? Mm -hmm. Can you talk, because you said that while you were writing, initially you just started journaling, and then you started seeing that there were some connections. Like, can you talk a little bit more about what are those larger connections that you saw um, playing out? Um, well, I started doing research just about other states and what educators were going through. And so it was actually pretty affirming that, wow, it wasn't just Atlanta Public Schools that was going through all of this with the overemphasis of high stakes testing, um, with the introduction of all these charter schools and privatization. It was like, this is happening over the entire country. And so I just felt like by me telling my story and putting the pieces together and having people to realize this is a national crisis. We cannot fight this in isolation. We need to come together to really show that, you know, this is affecting everyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. So during the middle of our, um, our trial, there was an article that came out in the local newspaper called D is for Darnley Charter School. And the, the article was actually about our trial and how it was a reminder of everything that had gone horribly wrong, you know, with, um, in Atlanta public schools and with education. And in the same article, is characterizing this charter school, um, called Jew Charter School, as a symbol of hope and renewal. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty blatant. They really weren't even trying to hide what they were doing. You know, um, we've got to come in here and these schools are failing and we need to fix them. We need to privatize these schools and have charter schools. I'm not sure, Anna, that you mentioned about the Opportunity School District. So the last day of, the, the last, the, the day that the prosecution rested, the governor, the next in line, um, Nathan Deal, he introduced new education legislation called the Opportunity School District which would take over failing schools, failing. <laughs> right, failing schools. And so he does this on the same day that the prosecution rests, which there's a lot of media coverage, just recapping the trial. And so it was almost in the sense of, you know, look at how awful public education is. Look at these teachers. You know, we need to come in here and take over these failing schools. And turn them into charter schools. And turn them into charter schools, right. Yeah, the Opportunity School District uh, was modeled on the Recovery School District in Louisiana, which mm -hmm. turned most of the world. Yeah, yeah, no more public schools in New Orleans. They're all charters. So they were trying to do that. Um, the Broad Foundation had flown in. Paul Pastore, uh, who was the state superintendent at that time, um, near Rob Kingsland, who was head of the New Schools Venture Fund, which got all this philanthropic investment into that whole process, they came and presented to our legislators um, and didn't, I think it was the same day they presented that the education, the joint education committee passed it out of, um, it was like a done deal, um, passed it out of committee that same day. So this would have required a constitutional referendum um, and as a result of incredible grassroots organizing, that was actually turned down during the um, 2016 election, like only maybe a good thing came out of that election. Um, but, but that built on years of um, similar efforts. So in 2008, I believe, the um, state created something called the Char uh, State Charter Commission, State Charter Schools Commission, to authorize charters that local districts did not want. 
Um, that got challenged by the, uh, a lawsuit that went up to the state Supreme Court. The state Supreme Court said, yes, you can't do that, namely because you're effectively levying local tax dollars by withholding the proportional amount of state funding that should be going to those school districts to pay for these charters. Um, so once the, that got shot down, lawmakers said, okay, let's change the Constitution then. <laughs> so there was a 2012 um, referendum where we saw money pouring in from Students First, from the Walton Family mm -hmm. Foundation, um, you know, the Walmart folks, um, all the same characters that are pushing these reforms and state policies all across the country. Um, and that did pass in 2012. So we had that State Charter Schools Commission letting in schools like Charter Schools USA, for-profit mm -hmm. company that um, got turned down three times by Winnett County Schools in Georgia mm -hmm. before this commission ultimately made it possible. And the reason that the school board is turning it down is because they're saying, hey, what is this um, company, Red Apple Development, which is the sister uh, company of Charter Schools USA, that wants to buy the land, build this school, and then charge you um, mm -hmm. way above market rent, mm -hmm. um, and essentially just pull those education dollars into this real estate company. Mm -hmm. You don't have a plan for transportation for students that need it. You have a history of pushing out um, special needs students. So these are the problems that you all know perfectly well that we're seeing mm -hmm. with charter schools but that um, you know, our state lawmakers are, are creating these workarounds to even the state constitution mm -hmm. to make it possible at the same time that they're criminalizing public school educators, mm -hmm. black educators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have similar, and I think it's in Canada where they have um, the Hope um, Renaissance. Renaissance, rather, and it's, it was a similar, yeah. like, the opportunity just is a hope. So they, I think they change the language, right? It's like the same thing, same thing but they use a little, a little bit different um, you know, in New York, it was you know they they tried to model their um, their their enrollment program similar to what they did in New Orleans, where it was a one enrollment program and application that students had to use to apply. Right, so they were doing so. This is stuff that's been happening. There are patterns that are happening throughout our country. And I think it's interesting that you said like this was a thriving black community and how you know how it was systematically and. Um, you know, dismantled, dismantle, right? Um, and how we see that playing out in so many different black communities throughout our country, in Detroit, or in, um, in Chicago, here in New York, you've got you know, New Orleans, like all this playing out. So what, and and I, I would like you to touch a little bit on, because I know you said that your experience with Teach for America, and if you could Teach for America's role in this too, whether it's, whether it's explicit or whether it's more underlined, but the role in this whole orchestration of um, the dismantling of brown and black communities and schools? Well, with Teach for America, and I will say that I was about 23 years old, fresh out of college, yeah, no. I didn't know anything about education or politics. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking, oh, yeah, we're going to go in and save these kids. You know, it, it, um, my mindset was a little different back then. And most of the people who joined Teach for America, we all had great intentions. We sincerely wanted to help children. Um, but the more I began to do research about it, it really seemed like the organization within itself, not the individual people, but yeah. that it had been co-opted by the corporate education reform movement. And so here you have a lot of veteran teachers that are being replaced with younger um, Teach for America teachers. You don't have to pay them more. Um, you don't have to pay them as much. Um, they're inexperienced. I'm so grateful that I had my mother, who's a veteran teacher, who was actually able to really helped me in the classroom. Um, but that definitely speaks to just the, it's almost like this cheapening of education, you know. Um, so yeah, so TFA, I'm, I guess I'm happy that I went through the experience. If I had to do it all over again, I would get a degree in uh, teaching or elementary education. Um, you, you also talk about in the book how, you know, TFA alum were even put in place in terms of like in board positions and in and, and, and policy positions where you can, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I think that really goes back to the, um, the roots of TFA because when Wendy Cobb founded it, you know, she did that with seed grants from these major corporations um, like mobile um, auto companies, um, I'm trying to think of the... Anyway, um, the way that she framed it was that it, it wasn't even student-centered. It was about giving um, these elite college graduates 
um, a pathway into higher positions. And so um, she said she wanted to surround the program with this aura of selectivity. Um, and what she thought was that if, if these people who are on track to be heads of corporations and judges and elected officials spend some time in a classroom, then they're more likely to make decisions that are good for school children. So it's actually never about like helping the school children as much as like shaping an ideology for the folks that are going to end up in positions of power. Um, and that has that has borne out. So TFA has an arm called um, the acronym is LEE, uh, Leadership in Educational. I'm going to blank on that. Um, something. It's like let that one go. Yeah. <laughs> but it's called LEE, and um, you know it supports uh, TFA graduates in running for public office. And so in 2013, um, we had the first Atlanta school board election since the scandal broke. So there was all this pressure to like clean house. And four of the nine people running were TFA alumni. Um, and they had money poured in from this widespread TFA network. Um, I know this happened in like Perth Amboy, New Jersey. I mean, this was right around the time that this like really, it was the first time that the major education reform money was getting focused on such a local level. Like, why is Arthur Rock, yeah, yeah. this like adventure capitalist yeah. in California, donating $100,000 yeah, yeah. or whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to uh, yeah, local school board <laughs> candidates? So those folks won um, their seats and um, proceeded to um, continue to vilify the, the teachers as the trial was going on. One of them was a former TFA person in your cohort. Um, and, and enact these pro-charter policies that we see um, taking root in Atlanta right now, um, including something that goes even beyond charters called partner school, but I can't tell you what that is because it doesn't, it's like even less, uh, yeah, yeah, we, that's like the next sort of thing to look into. It's like, y'all know about partner schools, yeah. so, um, and they, those schools are, are being turned over to a organization called Purpose Built Schools, which is a branch of Purpose Built Communities, which was created by developer Tom Cousins to replicate a model of dismantling public housing and turning the local um, public school into a charter school in this like one package. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's what's going on with those uh, the TFA connection to local elected school board officials. Yeah, we saw quite a bit of that too happening, more so like in um, larger, like in Jersey City, where we saw just rent, like, why is this person all the way in California donating all this money to a regular school board election? Um, and then when people connecting the dots, like, okay, then people are trying to actually literally buy pay from people's uh, 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 seats in the school board so they can influence, you know, local school policies. Um, and so, um, I just want to read an expert, and then I'm going to open up to people. Um, this wave of so we're talking, so this is a, um, an article that was, I think it's today, it's reading. Teachers are rising up to resist neoliberal tax on education. Um, and this wave of resistance has emerged to counter the neoliberal marketplace. So we're talking about the, the, the strikes that are happening throughout the, the nation. Um, neoliberal market-driven approach to education, which historically has cut across mainstream party lines, Market-driven reforms have been supported since the Reagan administration by every president and by every established political factions since the 1970s, refusing to promote the relationship between education and democracy, critical thinking, and active citizenship, and rejecting the connection between education and social and political change. The advocates, advocates of neoliberalism have weakened the power of teachers, attacked teachers' unions, reduced teaching to training and implemented a full-fledged attack on in the imagination through methods such as teaching for the test, cutting back on funding for the most basic necessities of schooling. Public schools have been transformed into charter schools or sites that aid the criminalization of poor black and brown students. Neoliberal leaders have moreover sought to strip schools of their anti-authoritarian, egalitarian potential to teach students to live as critical and informed citizens in a democracy. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how that might, this issue here ties into that right there. Um, we're, we're seeing that there's a, a, a concerted effort to attack teachers, teachers' unions, and ultimately a democracy. Mm -hmm. state. Yeah, I think that this is um, part of this long-running um, 
neoliberal, neoliberal uh, project to drain resources from the public sphere. And we talk about it in terms of going back to Brown versus the Board of Education mm -hmm. as a time when that, um, that trend really is rooted there because white parents, the white backlash to desegregation um, was the first time that we see things like vouchers being proposed and these ways of trying to use public funding to send white children to all white uh, private schools. Um, and there's a great book called White Flight um, by Kevin Cruz that really talks about, uh, as a case study, desegregation in Atlanta for looking at how um, the sort of right-wing turn toward neoliberalism is really rooted in that moment. And liberal, and you know, not only the right wing, um, because we see Democrats signing on uh, as well. We talk about things like the Trilateral Commission in the 1970s, mm -hmm. um, you know, this group of folks that are, are um, aligned with Rockefellers and um, the Jimmy Carter administration, um, putting out this report that says that the social movements of the 1960s and 70s um, have created a, quote, excess of democracy. <laughs> um, and that schools are no longer, uh, they literally use the word indoctrination. They aren't indoctrinating children as they should be. Um, and so draining the resources from, from public schools and, and I think that vilifying teachers is a, is a tactic in that, um, is a way to exert social control. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you said that. I was um, watching a, a clip from, um, it was, they were talking about how, you know, on, on the Fox News um, interview, one of the commentators had said that you know, they, were, they were trying to understand why these millennials are really, they're, 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 they're pushing for, you know, health care for everybody. Everyone should be happy. And they're, well, they're saying, well, the teachers are teaching fairness in school. And that's why. So then you have, then you have Junior, right, 45 Junior, saying things like, Teachers are teaching socialism. They're teaching kids to be fair. Like these are loser teachers, right? With this this idea that um, that teachers are, are are you know really teaching them to be overly democratic. Right? There's this um, this idea that that um, you know we need to control the masses and the people, right? More and more, and that's that's interesting. That I didn't realize that that was said back in the 70s. So that was that's interesting that we're seeing that happening right now. It's being said all over again. And that's what I was going to say, just to tie up what Anna was saying. You know, history just continues to repeat itself. itself. You know, um, <laughs> with the whole school choice and vouchers, how it was um, in Brown versus yeah. Board, and now school choice has become a dog whistle for yeah. segregation, privatization, um, and disinvestment. Yeah. And so we really have to pay attention. Yeah. A lot of times we don't see things happening until it's already happened and then it's like it's too late and now we're trying to backpedal and figure out how do we get into the situation. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, yeah. So we want to open it up to any questions. Yeah, yeah. Regina. <laughs> Hi, this is so interesting. Thank you. Um, have you had any reactions from reformers who have engaged with you? And the reason for this is because I'm um, so. A reformer affiliated with Deeper just responded to someone who posted up your link in our network. Oh. And basically, this reformer who is Deeper, who claims that she was there, uh, said this is mostly lies. Huh. Uh, you have created a, a false narrative. <laughs> um, basically, these teachers. Uh, and administrators sacrificed their integrity and their ambition for greed. greed. Uh, they didn't have to do it, they chose to do it. Uh, she says, this person says that she was there, that she was even, she was there, and says that um, the administrator came to her, to her office, and said to, for her to go to the office to clean up her so called tests after the school. Uh, anyway, so you, you get the picture, and it ends basically by saying um, they're the ones to blame. This book should be placed in the fiction category mm -hmm. on bookshelves. Rubbish. The narrative is still going on. Mm -hmm. Cory Booker is yeah. running for president. Yeah. He's still not. Yes. And he's not going to disavow. Yeah. Actually, there was a wonderful article that talked about how he sees his charter school accomplishments as his claim to fame. Yeah. He's not walking. 
um, back on that. So, yeah. um, have you had, have you heard from reformers? They just do this kind of smear job. Right. Yeah. I bet they want. Uh, they do that all the time. They, yeah. they hire they security firms. Mm -hmm. You know, I live in Montclair. Mm -hmm. the, the home of the reformers of John yeah. Schmer, they're all there. Yeah. The Nord reformers. Um, so, um, have you gotten any feedback from them? And, so far, no. That's actually the first comment. But I'd like, to even, <laughs> I'd like to even pick apart what you just said. Number one, they said greed. Yeah. And I've told you I've never received any bonus money. And the lead investigator on the case testified that bonus money had nothing to do with cheating. So that you know that in itself um, is a false narrative that teachers cheated for money. Um, I can't remember what, what else. It no, was just all, everything that, right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, going back to blaming, it was their fault. Once yeah. again, you're blaming the teachers, you're yeah. blaming the educators. Yeah. Um, so it's just back to this blame game. Yeah, yeah and I, I expect that we'll you know, hear from folks that, that were in atheists during that time and may have had experiences that were different from Shawnee's, different from the other folks on mm -hmm. trial. Yeah. And we are not saying that some cheating happened. We're, we don't know how it happened, and our point is that this trial did not get us any closer to understanding the yeah. truth yeah. or having any kind of restoration or, or transformation that we need in the school system. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we expect those comments, right. and, and they're coming, and we know it. <laughs> and I think it's really interesting in terms of like how people who are in power, how they reverse it and try to make it seem like those who do act, who actually have, like you, you benefited financially from right. nothing, right? And, and so even though they're the ones who are greedy, they flip it around, which is a form of gaslighting. It's a form of abuse, right? And what they're doing is they're gaslighting all of us. Exactly. And then some of us are eating it up and using that as, Oh no, but you are greedy. You wanted that two hundred dollars, five hundred, but you get you got nothing, right? When in fact they're walking away with the whole cake, right? And they've actually literally, right, walking away with all. See, look at them. They're the ones doing blah 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 when they're walking around, walking away with the entire cake while we're fighting over something that really would that's not even true, right? Completely true, right? Or at least what they're saying, or the, he's saying what's all lies. Well, she's telling her story, and her story is the truth. And that's the story that we're, we're listening to, and that's the story that we're hearing, and that's the story that she's sharing and going and moving forward with. Right? And, and just one thing, uh, the yeah. whole no accountability with the money, that's yeah. exactly what happened in Newark. Yeah, Nobody no accountability. What happened to that? I can't tell you what happened. You should all ask Corey what happened. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but Karen. Uh, uh, where was the teachers' union when all this was going Yes. Yes. We do have teachers' unions. Um. She said, oh, So I do know that there were, there were some attorneys provided for the teachers at some point during um, when the scandal first came to light. Outside of that, you know, wow. I really can't say <laughs> what oh, this one did. Man. This one is right. actually wait. Yeah. Right, and we get that question a lot. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Like, right. I'll tell you my, my story with the union, but yeah, that was like, not so, so yeah, it's really um, unfortunate that this even took place. I feel like if perhaps it was in another city, who knows what type of support the teachers would have gotten or what type of leadership would have stepped in and said, hey, this is wrong, um, and would have shut it down. That was not the case in Atlanta. Um, yeah. and given that it's such a national problem, it's yeah. standardized. You would think that Absolutely. Would be a teacher, a, you know, the UFT's issue. You would, <laughs> yeah, and Georgia is a right to work state. The, oh, the unions yeah. are yeah. contending yeah. with uh, it's like they're in triage mode all the time. So we don't know what the calculus was in terms of like setting their priorities and where this fell, but but it is unfortunate that it uh, that it happened that way. Mm -hmm. And not to even pick on people, I think though a lot of people were just scared. Yeah. Um, they were scared yeah. to speak out. This was such a big issue, and we were turned into monsters. You yeah. know, we and so it was almost like, how could you even try to support this? evil person who was cheating the children. You know, people didn't want to be associated with us. Yeah. So
So they were only going to do so much. And I really think that's kind of what happened. What was the administration, the principal of the school where you worked at? What happened to them? My principal was never indicted. Nothing happened to them. But her. you had to get directions from someone. So the testing court, the testing coordinator was indicted. The testing coordinator was indicted, and she was the one who called us into the room to erase the straight marks. But even the fact that my principal wasn't yeah. indicted, and you think that about a week, well, she didn't. She was never indicted, but I believe that she got immunity because she she told she. Te well, when I say testified, just in the GBI um, investigation, told one of the GBI agents that she didn't know that the teachers had come together to erase the stray marks. But that was something that was done every year. So I'm not even sure how she didn't know that. Um, but yeah, even just having a racketeering charge, how do you skip different levels of the chain of command? Um, it really, you know. I mean, the, the way that they had to interpret RICO to even bring these charges, um, they said that, um, the prosecutor said, two people can be in a conspiracy and not know it. If you uh, have the same intentions, take some similar outcomes, and uh, or take some similar actions and there's similar outcomes, you can be in a conspiracy. Um, but going back to the testing coordinator, she was indicted, but she was one of the folks that ended up taking a plea deal um, after being under what we perceived to be a lot of pressure. Yeah to take that plea deal and had to um, testify in exchange for that. So she was one of two witnesses who testified against Shawnee and two other teachers from the school. And her testimony with, I mean, this is some of the most, my, like the like compelling reading in this book is just like mm -hmm. the things that she said on the stand to try to make herself make sense and uh, just have the opposite effect. I'm talking about, oh, my light bulb just went mm -hmm. off. I think, I think maybe the coach was in the room too. And we've never heard about the coach before. Um, and even the reasoning that the two people who came in to testify against us, they said that first and second grade teachers cheated because their, their scores counted toward the adequate yearly progress and the targets. And we know that that is a yeah. lie. They yeah. don't, first and second grade yeah. test. So it didn't even make any sense, their testimony. It was just like, why are they saying this? Um, but once again, we should have never been put into that situation yeah. in the first place. Where people are scrambling, trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to get out of this? Yeah. What story do I need to come up with to get immunity or to yeah. get um, a plea deal? We should have never been put into that situation in the first place. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is there an appeal? Yeah. 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 Yes, we're in the middle of the appeal right now. And sadly, <laughs> so my attorneys have been working to try to get the judge off of our case. Before the verdict came out, he told the jury, whatever your verdict is, I will defend it until I die. And so, just going based off of his own words, we already know where he stands on this case. We don't even have to speculate. Mm -hmm. And just all the things that happened during the trial, it's hard to believe that he can still be an impartial judge. Yeah. And so they actually took it to the Court of Appeals um, and put in an application, this whole situation. The Court of Appeals recently denied it. We can't even, we can't figure out how they're getting away with this or, you know, how far up this goes um, for the Court of Appeals to now deny, after everything that he did, and now the Court of Appeals yeah. is denying it. So we, we're not really sure how this is happening. And that our judge actually retired and they reassigned our case to another judge. So we don't know how this same judge is able to preside over our case. And again, that's why I feel like there actually needs to be an investigation done mm -hmm. <laughs> to see what is going on, how high up does this really go? Because something is going on. Yeah. What I think is so important about the appeal is that this is where, this is like why we're here talking to y'all, <laughs> because um, we, we are hoping that by spreading the word and mobilizing folks, that, um, that there's a possibility that where we see points of intervention, mm -hmm. moments where by making a phone call, writing an email, or otherwise taking some kind of action, um, that we can affect the outcome of the appeal. And so we have a website called teacherontrial.com and we just encourage folks to sign mm -hmm. up for email updates. Mm -hmm. We wanna keep people informed because the first time around, 
um, the media that was coming out about the trial just wasn't connecting the dots in a way to enable folks to, to see what was going on until it was too late. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, please please stay in touch and stay tuned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't see it until we were seeing it live and mm -hmm. we saw the, the verdicts come through. Mm -hmm. Somebody yeah. passed out in the court. Yeah. And then yeah. somebody passed away. That was that 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 they should have been for something 
like this to happen. Um, so yeah. Well, you know, we're at a, a point now, when this was going on, could you remind me what year it was? The trial was in 2014 and 2015. Okay, well, and so the testing was a while before that. The, the year in question is 2009, so 2009 CRCT school. So, so think where we've come on standardized testing. Mm -hmm. You know, New Jersey, we now have, we got a law passed here that kids that age cannot be given standardized tests. They're not supposed to be subjected to standardized tests, right? Everybody in third grade and under. Well, mm -hmm. third grade up and for your testing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just the movement that we've had across the country on how standardized testing is viewed, not that there aren't mm -hmm. people in places who are like dying on, you know, mm -hmm. hold on to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think it's like, you know, how, how you're coming out now with the story, mm -hmm. um, even though there are the reformers who are still, because they have to support any kind of testing, right? Mm -hmm. You're in such a better position, I think, to tell the story. It's almost like the thinking about it is catching up to her. Mm -hmm. um, I'm glad you have a great public um, defender, and I'm, I'm just wondering if there are, um, mm -hmm. you know, universities down there with, um, have, you know, law schools, with legal legal um, clinics or mm -hmm. public interest groups that could um, help and give some support. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And even like, I feel like civil rights organizations or something like because this is such a larger, bigger issue that ties into things that we have all been fighting back against, like with the, the privatization of public education and, and the use of the open use of standardized tests. Like I think that this hits all of those different angles, although it's only centered in Atlanta, I think we have all been impacted by that. Um, and I'm like, you know, and it seems like it is a civil rights issue, right? And because you, you know, um, so yeah. And I think you, you said it was Chris Rogers that said we need to put together a defense team. Like how do we put together a defense team to, to, to address this because it, it's it's hitting on so many different things that affect all of us in so many different ways, and I think will bring to light, you know, in a much heightened way. Like, okay, so this could have actually happened in Newark. This could have happened in Camden. This could have happened in any of our big, larger cities here in New Jersey that it didn't happen to. Or maybe they just didn't happen to yet, right? Because um, the reformers just it just didn't get that far yet. They were doing other things, right? Um, so. Yeah. Well, I, want, I wanted to ask about that because in New Jersey we had our cheating scandal in 2011. Right? I don't know if you talk about other states and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Now, nothing ever happened. It happened in New York. Um, the Robert Treat Academy. Yeah, they had three times as many racial yeah. mm -hmm. or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah. nothing ever happened to them. Yeah, but if you think about the the well, Robert Treat, look who who owns Robert Treat, the Autobados. Right. Who are the Autobados? Very um, very white, very <laughs> very well connected politically. <laughs> um, and then their school is also very it's questionable. Like you know. They, they claim they use a lottery, but I'm, I, you know, I have a friend of mine who sends their children there, and she's like, well, a lot of the parents are all professionals. They're either academics at the yeah. university, yeah. they're lawyers, and so they, I don't think they're using a lottery in Newark. If you've got, a high, you've got most of the students come from two-parent households, who or parents are professors at the local university, or um, lawyers, and all these different political folks within the community, so that's why Robert Treat isn't. I, I'm going to say that's why Robert Tree has it. It, it didn't even get far. I mean, even, se even sexual harassment charges, too, as well, in Robert Tree. But that didn't even get to light, too, because of, you know. Okay. Mostly, like, there have been other cheating allegations in the past, even in Atlanta public schools. And teachers, you know, may be fired or have their teacher's license taken away. You know, these are normal responses to someone, you know, <laughs> not racketeering. <laughs> Um, so, again, we can't figure out why or who were the people involved or the decision makers on who actually decided to, you know, prosecute teachers and educators with racketeering charges. Mm -hmm. So as I continue to make my list of states that I can't visit, <laughs> it, it, it is quite extensive. <laughs> Um, no, seriously. So I wanted to ask you, because I know that, I think it's North Carolina with uh, Reverend Barber. Um, what, what do you, are there activists 
Like, we have lots of activists, and we've all been activists here in New Jersey, and when we first came out, they couldn't understand who, because the reformers were the ones who had the narrative, and when we spoke out, parents couldn't understand what we were talking about. We had to build up the narrative, yeah. mm -hmm. and yet, testing is still used, even in the Cory Booker chalk beat article, I yeah. talked about the, the, and it was today, yeah. um, it basically said, it still uses the test scores to say how yeah. much newer charters are great, yeah. you know, and, and how the public schools have gotten better because they're doing better on the test. And so my question is, mm -hmm. do you have education activists in Georgia? What is the surrounding community's reaction yeah. to this? I mean, because mm -hmm. I'm... I'm yeah. Yeah, I mean, John Lewis, your congressperson? Um, the concerned black clergy mm. in Atlanta, they were our biggest supporters. I mean, from beginning to the end. Um, and Reverend Timothy McDonald, who, he's a pastor at First Iconian Baptist Church. I mean, just that whole community, they've been our biggest supporters. Um, so yeah, outside of that, and we get this question all the time, and it's really... It's a little different. <laughs> the thing, yeah. So um, Atlanta has its own particular, um, you know, political situation where we're activists that we're organizing. I'm just activism, but like long-term base building, organizing um, doesn't quite happen on the level that folks would expect with its, you know, role in terms of the history of the civil rights movement. But but the South in general, and this is to your question of like states not to visit. Like, so I'm an editor of Scalawag Magazine, which is a regional publication of politics and culture. And um, we came out when the bathroom bills were coming down in North Carolina and there's this whole like boycott North Carolina. And we were like, y'all, don't leave us. Like, we have people fighting every day. And people who don't call themselves activists, but by the virtue of who they are in the world and what they do to survive and thrive, um, are, are absolutely making change every single day in the South and leading. I mean, we have Southerners on new ground, you know, launching the. Um, Black Mama's bailout in 2017 yeah, yeah. and sparking a nationwide movement to end money bail. Um, so the the South is is um, in the struggle all the time, yes. and um, and Atlanta is part of that. And this particular case, I think, just the unfortunate alignment of like where people's focuses were at the time and the utter like baffling nature of this as to like how do we even contend with this so we have people saying like I know this is wrong but I can't really tell like what's yeah. going on in a yeah. way to attack it so that's what we're hoping that this book can be is a tool and a resource to bring people together to be able to mobilize mm -hmm. right and I mean this is a multi-billion dollar industry so it's almost like we're trying to fight against the powers that be yeah. Yeah. and that's what the problem is is like all these like shadow government that we don't even know sometimes who the, the players yeah, yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. So it will take like a national movement and it's happening. People are rising up. And so that's interesting that my story <coughs> is kind of coming out at this time to kind of show people, look, this is how we got here in the first place. Look at look, look at what they did um, to kind of connect the dots. And so we hope to see more of that people really galvanizing and coming around this issue. Um, because, yeah, we're going up against this whole power structure that has, like, billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. um, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, in terms of the trial and the scapegoat and things like that, um, I know you said that, like, you know, you felt like it was, like, essentially people trying to turn around and, you know, blame you guys and teachers for, like, what's wrong with the community, what's wrong with the schools. Mm -hmm. um, and on a certain level, it seems like it's almost like, uh, scapegoating for like, well, if something's wrong with the tests, then like, it's the teachers who are trying to like, you know, like maneuver the tests. Like, not that the tests themselves are bad, it's like these teachers who are trying to like, cheat the tests. Mm -hmm. um, right. And it kind of made me think back to um, a book that we were reading this summer, we read um, Marxist Education by mm -hmm. Wayne Howe. Mm -hmm. And I think he says that like, this is like just a number of like 60% or 80% or something of a student's test score can be attributed to something As outside school of school factors. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. you know, um, care, housing, lack of health care, housing, lack of health care, any mm -hmm. number of things. Yeah. Um, so, 
Yeah, that just came to mind in terms of when we're talking about like the country's reaction to testing itself and the air guy situation, um, where it's almost like in defense of testing um, and the industry around testing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just constant scapegoating, really. And the more that you can scapegoat people, you never have to fix the system. Mm -hmm. You never have to try to fix the problems. You don't have to address poverty. Mm -hmm. What is poverty? You just have a great teacher and be lifted right up out of poverty. Mm -hmm. You know, you never have to address anything. Mm -hmm. And it's not that good teachers aren't important, but like you said, even with that book, 60, yeah, um, 60%, 60%, right. Um, it's so many other factors. And so I think that's the part that a lot of people are missing Mm -hmm. um, that we really need to come together and actually try to change the system. Yeah. And I think it also shifts, like when we're only looking at the thing that's closest to us, like we're only looking at the person because we have direct contact, like the individual, like when they shift the gaze and say, oh no, it's the teacher, see, right? It's them, they're the ones, they're the ones. It actually distracts us from the larger mm -hmm. <laughs> and the bigger, the bigger problem, like the people that are actually orchestrating all these things, right? Yeah. If we start, if we turn on the system, we turn on the testing industry, we turn on these corporations, we turn on these people who are creating these policies, then they lose power, right? Yeah. But if we say, oh no, it's the teacher, right? It's the teacher, yeah. they're the ones, then we, then we get angry at the teacher and we shift our gaze and we start throwing rocks and stones at them, when in fact we should be really, all of us should be banding together to turn on that small yeah. percent of people that are actually those billionaires that are actually controlling so much of what's happening in our, in our country, in our nation, in our schools, and owning and making tons and billions of dollars from the test, and making billions of dollars from creating these charter schools, when in fact, it's, you know, uh, you know And the they own and control the media. Absolutely. Yes. You know, yeah. so that's why this is so hard. Yeah. You know, um, just fighting that, uh, that battle, um, just with false narratives. Um, and so, yeah, having conversations like this, really getting out the truth. And like I said, the truth will stand on its own and no matter what the media says, if more people know what happened. Um, but yeah. Teacheroncrowd.com. And I'm also on Facebook and Twitter at Shawnee Author. Um, to your point, like I think about as a teacher how many times I've been asked by students like, why do we have to take this test? <laughs> and oftentimes my answer is like, I don't know. <laughs> like you just said, like, we have to take it. Like, you know, yeah, it's not my choice. Um, but I wonder like what would be the significance or ramifications of like actually taking time in the classroom to explain. Yes. Not even explain it, but like to, yeah, to give room to like do some investigative, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, you know, Ooh, work serves. or learning mm -hmm. around that as a class. Mm -hmm. Like, why do we have to take this? Where is mm -hmm. this coming from? Mm -hmm. um, and it could be explanation, or it could even be like, yeah, like research. But research, <laughs> let's right. research this like, you know, and discovery on your own, exploring, right? right? Like, let's talk about like why? Why do we have to take it? Where did they come from? Who's making money from it? Right, who's benefiting? Follow the right. money. Yeah. 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 Follow the money. Across the country, everything leads back to Pearson. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Pearson. Or, or, or larger different they, corporations. They to mm -hmm. All the corporations, powerful. Yeah. Pearson, yeah. 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 we got in that district, start the Renaissance yeah. testing. Yeah. Yeah. This is the new testing that we're implementing in the district. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. This is something totally different. So it's like everything, it's like, who's bringing this up? I said, like, who's the foundation, who's mm -hmm. the founding company? Mm -hmm. Pearson. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So it all, it's the Koch brothers, and they own everything. So if you break down the school system, and you look at it, everybody's making money off of it. Mm -hmm. But if we break down the schools, we can build. Right. That's why you're building more prisons in Philly. Yeah. And they broke down mm -hmm. the public school system in Philly. Mm -hmm. So we're expanding that. Oh, we don't have money for public schools in Philly. Where did the money go? Mm -hmm. The new prison system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's how this money is all mm -hmm. working out. But nothing's changed. They've been doing charges to 70s. Because I remember yeah. being in the schools mm -hmm. and in California and taking the test. Mm -hmm. It made no sense. Mm -hmm. Or you're testing kids in urban areas mm -hmm. that live in the projects asking them if they use cups and saucers. Mm -hmm. No, you got a jelly jars. Mm -hmm. You have a knife and a fork to eat. Mm -hmm. No, we got paper plates sometimes. 
Mm-hmm. Or it's not enough to go around. So the drip right. would never Bias. help us yeah. or about right. anything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But that's how I grew up in Newark. So mm-hmm. test, 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 test. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Erin? Um, I have two questions. One is, who was on the jury, and what do you know about the jury selection process? And the other is, to what degree did you notice any like gender dynamics coming up in terms of who was um, indicted, men or women, elementary versus high school, things like that? Um, so let's talk about this jury selection. Um, now, the jury actually ended up in its final stage as being pretty diverse. However, during the process, I think there were like 600 potential jurors brought in because the story was so much in the media, they, it was hard to even find impartial jurors, you know, because um, there were a lot of people who said, yeah, I can remember when this happened or when that happened, and it's just so much against them, they must be guilty, you know. Um, and then there were other people who were thinking, this is ridiculous, these are teachers, you know, right, and I'm like, please don't say that, we need you on the jury. <laughs> like, no, they were dismissed. <laughs> um, so it went, it went both ways, um, but they noticed that there were, there was a lack of potential black jurors. And so they actually called in a, an expert witness to testify in front of the judge to say, hey, something is going on with this system. Um, there, it was about 11% too low on black jurors. And so the judge basically, he didn't really do anything. Uh, we, the trial marched on, even though there was clearly an issue. In May of 2017, we learned Fulton County was improperly selecting their jurors. Tens of thousands of names were being left off. This was decided on by the Georgia Supreme Court. So, in a different case, not in our case. So this actually hasn't even affected our case yet. We're still hopeful, um, but the fact that we brought this issue up, you know, um, but they were just so intent on this going to trial. It, it should have never actually even gone to trial. It's so many different things that should have shut it down. But any little, um, you know, barrier or hurdle, it was like, oh, well, we're just gonna move around it and we're gonna keep on going with the trial. Um, but as far as the, the gender question, you know, educators are mostly women. Um, so out of the 35, I don't remember, it, it was definitely women, uh, black women, who were indicted. Um, so, yeah, maybe two, right, there were two that actually went to trial, the 12 of us that were men. But even out of the 35, it wasn't as many, it was mostly black women. I haven't been in contact with them, but I have been in contact with the families, you know, just to try to make sure that they're okay. Um, and I mean, they're in prison and they have children and families, so I can't say that they're doing okay, you know. Um, one of the teachers was sentenced with five years to serve two. And then there was an executive director that was sentenced with 10 years to serve three. Her, her initial sentence was 20 years to serve seven, and then the judge later um, reduced it. 20 years to serve seven. Did somebody get promoted? Like, like you know how I was. <laughs> so, <laughs> I have to say, you know, a misdynamic going on, and I have an issue with the South anyway, but um, that's another story. That it's almost like its own conspiracy. Yeah, we're yes. going to do this so we can bolster ourselves. If you lock up the black women, you don't have to worry about them having any more kids. You'll oh, separate it, the family and break down the family dynamic. Because now it's, it's right. either grandma, auntie, maybe the husband. Do they have a husband? We can just mess this whole thing up. Mm-hmm. Then you set the kids up. Because now psychologically, my parent is in prison. What can right. we do? I don't know if it absolutely affects your voting rights. Mm-hmm. If you get out, I don't, I don't know like what that is. But this sounds absolutely 
this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. And I'm not saying you're stupid. No, no. I've never you know, heard of. I mean, the thing is, I think that they. Who's getting paid to lock up the teachers? Like, I, somebody that's a good had, question. like, there's a money train going on. The judge is probably doing what he's doing because they got something on him. And if you don't do it this way, you can kiss your butt goodbye. You, you can come and join us. You can say things that we can't <laughs> <Yeah>. say. There's <laughs> also And I was just gonna say, even as far as like how you know my co-defendants have children, like they really, even in my situation, when they sentenced me, my mother actually spoke on my behalf and she begged the judge, please don't separate my daughter from her son. Because my my son was only four months old at the time. And so um he was he was really upset that I had attended this prayer rally. The judge was upset that I attended this prayer rally, um, and he was like, I saw her on TV, and she was dancing around, and you know, they were, right, so he was mad that I uh, went to this prayer rally. You know, Black Joy. Right, exactly. <laughs> dancing Joy. Around. And so, um, he actually made a comment, He, well, my attorney was trying to explain the prayer rally, and he said, well, I don't know if people just drank the Kool-Aid or what. That's what he told me. And then my mother also said she was explaining the importance of allowing me to nurse, you know, the importance of just Why nursing. And the lead prosecutor, <laughs> the lead prosecutor, Fonnie Willis, said, well, basically, to paraphrase what she said, that this appeal could take so long that, you know, nursing for this child wouldn't even be affected. But who were you to say that? And, you know, if you look at what's going on now, how the parents are separated at the border from their children, yeah. mm -hmm. these are the same people that are doing this to you. Exactly. You just happen to become president. Mm -hmm. This has been going on for three For years. years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. I find it just mind-boggling yeah. that it seems to be okay. I'm like... But it, and I also think it, it speaks to a larger too. Of this, um, so we know that prior to Brown versus Board of Education, black educators made up 17% of the um, teaching profession in the South, right? right. Um, and we know now that like you can go, it might range, it might change a little bit depending on what community you're in, but for the most part, we fluctuate anywhere between 6 to 7%. Right, and so when we're seeing black educators being pushed out, so after Brown versus Board of Education, the 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 the, 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 the white segregated schools or the now the new integrated schools wouldn't wouldn't even hire black educators or black teachers. They're being also fired from their schools. But then we're seeing this play out in so many different ways, even throughout the North. So it wasn't just the South. So I know South gets a lot of black, but we're, we're New Jersey is called New Jersey is called the Georgia of the North, right? And so. Um, and so, but we also see how if there, so with even the No Child Left Behind, I mean the race to the top, we saw black teachers being pushed out of the classroom in Chicago, in Detroit, in Newark, being fired from their jobs or transferred from out of their classrooms out of the schools, being replaced with all white teachers, right, mostly white teachers. So we're also seeing a whitening of, of America or a heightened whitening of America in the institutions that teach or they're designed to teach, well, we hope, hopefully, are teaching democracy, right? And then when you have black educators, also it's a very different experience and learning environment that, um, that is cultivated and creative. When we strip them, when we take them out, we're also doing, we're, we're taking out all these different aspects of, of the school, um, of, you know, um, you know and we're also seeing like how teachers also being, black educators are being attacked for teaching social justice pedagogy too as well, either being fired or being let go or being demoted, like all these different things are kind of playing out. So it's not just, which is why we have organizations like Journey for Justice Alliance that have in the We Choose campaign, like their, one of their demands and one of their focuses is the attack on black educators and how we're seeing that. We met with a principal an administrator in New Orleans and she had been fired from her job and um, from you know, you know, trying to create a, a school or an environment um, that was going to be conducive for the students and then pushing back on the board members because they weren't providing the resources and the funds and then they fired her, right? And now she's left without a job. So this is not, this is not something that's isolated. This is something that we, we have to figure out a way to do some real deep um, strategic organizing around um, in ways that, you know, are going, you know, it's just, 
it's again, it's the over policing, the over criminalization of black and brown bodies in our country, and there's constantly that push, and um, in so many different ways. Like we're seeing it manifest in so many different ways, but I think this is just one of the examples, um, and 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 the continuation of what happened then, right? Because we know after Brown, there were so many things that were taking place that were. You know, we were doing so well, and then we say, look, look, we're going to dismantle that, we're going to destroy it, we're going to figure out ways to, to get rid of the success that was happening with um, and brown and black communities. So, you're from Carrie, and yeah. then we'll go to Regina. So just to touch on Journey for Justice, they worked so hard to get um, the New York schools to um, mm -hmm. be back into public control, and yeah. then they just had the Board of Ed election, and three of their candidates were from charter schools. Yes. Like, and they were yeah. heavily, yes. heavily funded. It's really yeah. not, yeah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Regina. So I'm thinking about this whole language of reform, and it's so interesting because I can safely say that Sonny Perdue and all these people, and we know, are Republicans, right? So we could see it in a certain light, and I know in Florida that was the case as well, uh, with Jeb Bush and all of his reforms. But then you get, and, and this is the problem of, of addressing these reforms, because then we come to New Jersey, and we see that it's the Democrats, yes, and right naturally, right. it's been the Democrats, yeah. because they actually got worse under Obama, yeah. the race to the top. Yeah. And, and, and then also, if you think about black and white parents, mm -hmm. but there's also a segment of the black community that is in line with reforms mm -hmm. yeah. in the name of equity. By the way, yeah. the comments yeah. that I read from you were so, for so, making so. for a person who is African American yeah. uh -huh. and who comes up to our board meetings and, and will, you know, uh, yeah. call. So, it's, so yeah. when we talk about concretizing it, it's so difficult because yeah. It changes its shape yeah, yeah. depending on where you go and where the arguments are coming from. And that's why it's like a multi-headed hybrid. You, know, you just yeah. can't whack it because yeah. it's, it just throws something else, right? And so I think uh, the only reason why I'm saying this is because as I'm listening to all of, of, all of this, it's just so hard to, to put your finger on it and say, well, that's the problem. Right. Because it just changes depending on the context, the culture of the place, who's in power. So I wish I could say it's just a Republican. No. But there's no. one common denominator, and it's money. money. So it doesn't matter if it's Democratic, yes. Uh, yes. you know, Republican, yes. Black, yes. White. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's greed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's money. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, the way structural racism works is that people of all colors can play a role in upholding systems of oppression. Um, yeah. I just want to speak to my head when I was reading about the white community organization and how they organize. And one of the first things they want people to do is get on school boards. I mean, that's the stepping yes. stone to having power. Mm -hmm. And they're funded to do that, and it's happening across the country. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, since there was too much democracy, the, the right has <laughs> been really active mm -hmm. in, in many different avenues. And that's why I think it's not just, you know, Atlanta, it's, 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 it's capitalism. Yeah, it's capitalism. Right? <laughs> yeah. It's the system yeah. is mm -hmm. just so. Yeah. We have to get deeply involved. I I think it's like you know you were saying those states you won't go to. I, I think that's a part of the problem because yeah. I think, you know people who have the privilege to leave as countries get trumps here. That's not helping. Mm -hmm. What we need to do is dig deeper. Get in the school boards. Get involved in this stuff. And like you know see the common denominators and be involved in it because it's 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 this this is for shit. Mm -hmm. And you know, we need every every person with a consciousness to get there and get at it. And Karen does announce her campaign. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 yes. Um, I just want to go back to some of your co-defendants who are in prison. Yeah. Um, do you know if there's a way uh, do you have a way for us to communicate with them? Because um, those of them see themselves as innocent, um, we could we could take them on as political prisoners. Yes. And they yes. Yes. 
No, you're absolutely right. They are political prisoners. Um, and that's something that we definitely, and that's why we need people to sign up so we can stay in touch um, and really just communicate and figure out how can we solve this problem. And we've gotten that question a few times, so I think that's like, it's helpful because that's like a concrete next step that we can go back um, and, and reach out to them, find out what, what they would like and share that out with you all. So thank you for that. Just a quick comment. Have you reached out to Black Lives Matter? Are they aware of this? And do yeah, they are actually been very supportive. Yeah. Um, the Atlanta chapter Black Lives Matter, yes, they are very supportive. That is one organization, yes. Mm -hmm. Any actions coming from that? Like, we're still um, working to try to organize and figure out the best route to take because um, we want to be strategic about it, um, but they are very supportive. Okay. All right, and any last question? Yeah. I guess just to respond to your question about like trying to make sense of where the left or the liberal side of this is coming from, part of what's helped me make sense of that is a lot of it, I think, goes back to the staunch anti-communism of the 1950s and even the 30s and 40s because that both eviscerated radical unionists so that unions moved much further to the right in order to continue to exist. And also some of the fathers of these like right-wing activist movements called education the most socialized institution in America. And so this idea of public education being socialism, which, mm -hmm. I mean, it kind of is, yeah. but so then the left needs to like back off from that so as not to be accused of supporting this sort of socialist socialism. institutions, which we see happening very yeah, much. It was right created to create a working force. <laughs> that was what public education was there for, just to educate people enough to be workers, not to be democratic. <laughs> sure, 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 but in terms of just framing it. So I just, in terms of moving all of this to the right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Even the Democratic Party, is what I'm saying. What's the last comment? Okay. <laughs> the school board elected, or were they of any help, like like the school board in your district? Or in our, is it an elected school board? Um, the comment that I heard from one school board member was that um, they they were just going to let the justice system like play out, and that they weren't going to assist in any way. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shani. You know, National Freedom School, we are organizers, so we are willing and, and like to get put some work in. We also are connected to national organizations and organizers and educators who are about that life or about you know you know drawing attention to and organizing around this and so so please let us know how we can help beyond just you know getting the word out but doing some some organizing work as as TJ even alluded to this if we can even lift them up as political prisoners because that's actually what they are how do we you know how do we do some organizing around this and also organizing around bringing um, an end to this for, for you all, but then for all of us. So, thanks again. Thank you. Yeah. Where did you get the book? Oh, the book is going to be on sale over here. You guys can buy it. All right. So, um, what is? Yes. You want to make an announcement? Yeah, the book is going for thirty dollars a piece. Are we asking for an exact change or PayPal? Okay. Can we use our credit card then? Yeah, PayPal. Uh, PayPal. PayPal. I think this doesn't count. Oh, count to account. Oh, okay. So I'll need your account.